When you're trying to determine the the risk of having a cardio, cardiovascular event for a patient that's sitting in front of you, um, and I know in, in this paper you spoke about a 10-year kind of risk estimation or calculation, is that usually what you're looking at, the risk of having some event in the next 10 years? Um, because I would, I would think... You know, certainly for some of my age, I'm, I'm interested when it comes to the decision-making process of should I take a lipid-lowering drug, what's my risk of having a, a, a heart attack in 15 years, 20 years, 30 years? What can I do now that's going to stop me having a heart attack you know, before I'm 70, 75? A lot of the, a lot of the conversations we have are based upon the – information that's provided in things like guidelines and and which are recognized by insurance companies and which as societies we have to acknowledge even if we think that biologically or philosophically there's more to it than what we can say um, the it, it stems from um, a, an approach that is described as evidence-based medicine I'm sure you're familiar with that that concept but I'm old enough at age 57 to remember a time when people would have conversations about the rise of evidence-based medicine. And that differs from how we always took care of patients before my generation, which was a sort of tutelage. You know, a, a clinician learned from their master who learned from their master. And it was a traditional approach, almost more like an Eastern approach. It was Certainly, there was science and evidence that, we, you know, my generation didn't invent evidence-based medicine, but they, they brought it to the front to show that you, you can't just use your best judgment right. and the biology and the – you, you need – you show me that drug X works better than placebo before you start telling me to take drug X. And the, way, the, the tools that are disposal are these – the best tools are randomized placebo-controlled trials. So the first set of cholesterol national guidelines that were that was strictly adherent to evidence-based medicine with that you know prioritizing randomized placebo controlled trials and meta-analyses of the same was the 2013 AHA ACC AHA cholesterol guideline. It's not that the NIH that wrote the guidelines before then didn't use evidence. They did. They used but they used lots of evidence. They used RCT evidence, but and they also used meta-analyses, but they also used angiographic data. They used studies that had interme intermediates. They used genetic information, clinical epidemiology, and expert opinion to formulate these ideas. And in around 2011, the Institute of Medicine actually set out some guidelines on how to write guidelines. And they said, it, before any organization writes a guideline for how people should be practicing medicine, they said, these are the standards that should be followed. And they set the bar very high. They said, RCT evidence and meta-analyses of the same, it should be at the fore, and clinical decisions should be based upon that. And, and the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology stood up and said, we can write that guideline. We can do a good job um, reviewing the data, reviewing the evidence, and setting out how doctors should manage care. And, around, and they, they issued that set of guidelines in 2013. But in 2013, the only big RCT evidence for ASCVD risk reduction with medication came from statins. There was all, you had to go back to the 1970s and 1980s to find evidence with cholestyramine and gemfibrozil with a stretch, if you use your imagination, you can say niacin also. Um, but that, that was sort of antiquated data at, uh, at that time. And by 2013, we had numerous clinical trials showing that statin drugs reduce ASCVD risk. And so in 2013, the evidence could only support using that kind of approach. Those clinical trials are all, what, three years, five years? We don't have 30-year clinical trials with those drugs. Same thing is with risk calculation. So you're, when you're trying to estimate what someone's risk is and whether they qualify for medicine using this strict evidence-based approach, well, how were the clinical trials done? Well, how did you get into the clinical trial? You had to, you know, some of them were 
so-called secondary prevention trials, meaning you had to have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. If you've had a heart attack, a stroke, and you know, stents, bypass, whatever your event was, that qualified you. And then there were primary prevention studies, people who have never had cardiovascular event, but they oftentimes, you know, had qualifying fact factors like in an LDL cholesterol above a certain range or the presence of some other factor like diabetes or multiple risk factors, you know, to, to, to be able to get into the study. So that's how the clinical trials were designed. And so when you're writing a guideline that's based on the evidence, you have to base it on how the clinical trials were designed. And so there's going to be plenty of individuals that you see in clinic that don't fit into those perfect buckets. Exactly. So, the, you know, that set of guidelines did something else that was really useful, which is they introduced some epidemiologic evidence uh, using something called the pooled cohort risk equation, which was a, a much more inclusive body of evidence to support how to estimate risk that went beyond just clinical trials like the Framingham study, which had a, you know, it was mostly white and uh, population and didn't have quite the ethnic diversity that you could get from a broader scope. And so the pooled cohort risk equation was a big improvement as a risk predictive tool, but it still primarily provides us with a 10 year predictive tool. Um, there's a, you know, there are, there's a 30 year extension to that, that a lot of us use. And so if you came to me, I would consider using a tool like the pooled cohort risk equation with a, the 30 year extension and think about you in the long run that way. Um, and that they've even improved upon that. And we, you know, uh, something called the prevent risk calculator. How do you feel about the whole cholesterol years concept? Have you seen that where it's, it's yeah. kind of, uh, akin to pack years with cigarettes so kind of lifetime exposure to cholesterol and i can kind of inv i can remember a chart that i've seen in a paper and it's when you go over a certain sort of thousand milligrams of per deciliter of uh cholesterol then you're at uh, a stage where you I, I believe you may start to see symptomatic atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease have you seen that graph that i'm talking about i have it, it um I think conceptually, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I actually have a have a graphic that I use in my teaching that sort of uses the same concept. Um, but I think in the clinic, um, it, it, it doesn't really resonate for me, partly because you know, I don't know what their levels have been that whole time. It, I would have to extrapolate based upon where they are now. People, you know... LDL cholesterol levels don't change that much over time, but they do change. They change with puberty. They change uh, throughout adulthood. There's a gradual increase. And menopause. Menopause, like big changes. And, uh, and by the way, when I say LDL cholesterol, I'm also yeah. including ApoB. I recently ran my full labs through Function Health. And I have to say the results were eye-opening. Turns out my ApoB was higher than ideal, probably thanks to a little too much coconut yogurt. I also found out I was slightly low in copper, something that I would have never suspected without testing. On the flip side, my biological age came back 13.3 years younger than my actual age, a calculation based on the work of aging researcher, Dr. Morgan Levine. So all in all, I've got a few tweaks to make to optimize my lipids and nutrient status, but overall my blood work says I'm doing pretty well. That's what I love about function. You get access to over 160 biomarkers covering everything from hormones and inflammation to nutrients, toxins, cardiovascular risk, and more. And all your results are housed in one beautiful platform, all tracked over time. Once you get your results, you can make informed changes before small issues become big ones. To get started, head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. The first 1,000 people get a $100 credit toward their membership. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill.